Good evening, I'm Maravel Tarouk. Protests along Via Rail and GO lines stopped train service in Toronto today. The group responsible is in solidarity with the Wet'suwet'en Nation in BC. They're fighting against the coastal gas link pipeline meant to be built in their territory. Our Yeva Lutz is at the Davenport Diamond where the protesters ended up today. Yeva, what's the latest? Well, Maravel, as you can see behind me, there are no longer protests at this spot. The protesters have dispersed. But up until about half an hour ago, there were still two dozen here going strong. Right now, police are just checking the tracks, making sure it's safe, making sure there's no protesters along the tracks so that they can start running trains again. Amazingly, the protesters who were here for a large chunk of the day had been here since 11 o'clock this morning. They started their demonstration at Dovercourt Park and made their way here. Since then, they were blocking these tracks. These protesters say that they're here in solidarity with the Wet'suwet'en Nation in BC. That's a group trying to stop the construction of the coastal gas link pipeline into their territory. Now, there were some signs at the protest today that said stop the RCMP. That's because police have been moving into that territory in B.C. in order to clear the way for the construction. We spoke to some of the protesters today here in Toronto, and they told us why this is such an important fight for them all the way here in Ontario. This is part of like shared traditional territory on Anishinaabek, uh, for Anishinaabek people, and um, we're here to disrupt in any way we can to stand in solidarity. We are blocking the CP rail. CP is moving the pipe out for the pipeline. The, you know, rail lines are an important part of Canada's economy and it's important that we disrupt that at times like this. Now, Yeva, that's a key rail corridor where you are at. So, so what did the protests do uh, to, in terms of having an impact on rail traffic and transit today? Well, one of the things that happened here was that a CP train actually approached this spot where the protesters were and had to stop. The issue here, though, is that the CP train and the CP tracks also uh, intersect with the GO train tracks. So Metrolinx told us that the Barry GO line had to be stopped because of that stopped CP train. That caused many delays, as you can imagine. Eventually, the Barry GO line train started to run up again, slowly around this area, just to make sure it wasn't going to uh, run into any protesters. However, in Belleville, the protesters have been going on for days. In fact, an injunction was just served by CN against those protesters. We've found out. Three days ago, members of the Tyndanaga Mohawk began to block the Via Rail lines between Toronto and Ottawa and Toronto and Montreal. Trains between those places have been cancelled today, and 28 trains were cancelled yesterday. We spoke to some of the passengers who were stranded by the cancellations. I tried to go yesterday, but it happened like the same thing happened again, like it got canceled. So they put me on a train for today, but I'm assuming it's canceled again because it's, it's signs are saying that they are. So it's frustrating. Yeah, I, I'll try bus. I'll try Greyhound after this, but they might also be full from all the cancellations. So that's my next stop. I think they could have helped us out a little bit getting us east but it's just more of a you know too bad so sad it's out of our control sort of thing now we have to wait and see what happens with that injunction but via rail is saying that passengers should check twitter and check online to see if they have any trains that are cancelled or delayed tomorrow uh, and as for the protesters here they told us that they're going to keep protesting un uh, until the rcmp continues to block those uh, keep those clear those blockades in bc marivelle lot still to, to develop this weekend thanks so much for this yeva Coronavirus will likely kill more people than SARS, according to the World Health Organization. But it also points out some positive news. The number of cases is going down in China's Hubei province, where the disease started. Lorenda Redekop with more on what we're learning. More patients are transferred to one of Wuhan's new hospitals, specifically built to treat coronavirus patients. The World Health Organization says more than 700 people in mainland China have now died from the virus. 
SARS killed 774 people worldwide, so coronavirus is expected to be more deadly. But also some encouraging signs. There has been a stabilization in the, the number of uh, cases reported from Hubei, and uh, we're in a sort of a four-day stable period where the disease uh, or the number of reported cases hasn't advanced. But the WHO cautions numbers can spike again. Plus, Hubei province has reported a shortage of medical supplies. So the epidemic is far from over. Uh, we see good signs um, and we see signs of control, but uh, we, at this point, uh, the best thing rather than crystal ball gazing is vigilance. Outside China, the largest number of cases is on a cruise ship in Japan. More than 60 people tested positive, including some Canadians. Remaining passengers are under quarantine until February 19th. The coronavirus test that I took four days ago came back negative. Um, so waking up this morning and knowing that my test came back negative made for a very relaxing, worry-free day. His cabin has a balcony. Others aren't so lucky, in cramped inner rooms with no windows. Those passengers are now allowed out for controlled walks on the ship. Another ship is quarantined in Hong Kong. So far, no positive cases have been reported there. Five new cases have been confirmed at a French ski resort. They're all British travelers, including one child. Schools there will remain closed for the next week as officials investigate who they had contact with. Meanwhile, the WHO is preparing to send an investigative team to Wuhan early next week. Lorenda Redekamp, CBC News, Toronto. Public health officials and advocacy groups visited Toronto's Chinese community today to help ease concerns and stop the spread of misinformation about the coronavirus. I asked them if they are afraid and concerned. They are. They are concerned for themselves and they are concerned for their families and their loved ones overseas. So the message that I sent was that don't let fear control yourself. Don't let fear drive you to irrational actions and behaviors and don't look for information just online, you know. The event took place at the Woodside Square Mall in Scarborough. Participants had a chance to ask questions about how the virus is spread and what's being done to address it. Health officials emphasized people in Toronto are still at low risk of contracting the virus. The Chinese-Canadian community is also helping those who have self-quarantined after returning from China. Volunteers have come together to deliver groceries and necessities to those who are confined to their homes. Angelina King caught up with some of the volunteers in the GTA. We buy some for the rice ball, you can call it a Chinese-style dumpling. Naijun Wang is packing up another delivery of groceries and necessities, hand sanitizer and masks. In the last two weeks, he's delivered about a dozen packages to people who are self-quarantined after arriving back home in Ontario from China. We focus on teamwork, right? And if one person needs help, as a you know, Canadian, and uh, it's my duty to help them. As the member of the community, I just uh, want to, to contribute to something. Also, I, I want to set an example for my song. Volunteers say there are hundreds across Ontario ready to help complete strangers with anything, from grocery shopping and running errands to delivering vehicles at the airport. Those who are self-quarantined say even though they aren't sick and weren't near the coronavirus epicenter, they're being extra cautious to protect others. This is a sensible and responsible action for my own family, for the co-workers and for the societies. And I think this is the right thing to do. Lyndon, Mark Ham, Misaga. Volunteers created groups on WeChat based on areas. Those who are self-quarantined can join the group, request what they need and post their address. A volunteer responds based on location, picks up and delivers the items. The bill is paid through e-transfer and volunteers don't charge a cent more. They leave the bags outside the house, take a photo and alert the person inside. There's never face-to-face -face contact. And this really uh, shows solidarity and uh, helpfulness. And now I have a full, you know, uh, a full fridge of uh, vegetables. To support each other. And then I think we, finally we will win the battle with the, the virus.
The volunteers say they'll continue making deliveries as long as needed, saying if people continue to take extra precautions to keep other people safe, they'll keep helping them to make that possible. Angelina King, CBC News, Mississauga. Let's do our first check of the weather this weekend. Rachel Schutzen is here with that. Listen, that sunshine almost made up for how chilly it is out there. <laughs> Were you cold today? It was, it was cold, but I, I like the rays of sun. I agree. That nice dose of vitamin D. Minus 7 is as warm as it got today in Toronto. We're minus 8 right now. With the wind chill through the overnight, it is going to feel bitterly cold. Let's take a look at it right here. Huntsville feels closer to minus 30. Barrie, minus 22. That's what it feels like. And as we get into tomorrow morning, if you're going for a run or you're walking the dog, you need lots and lots of layers. Up in Peterborough feels like minus 18. Toronto is going to get a little bit warmer, but that beautiful, beautiful sunshine, we're going to lose it as we go throughout the day tomorrow and that is hinting at another system that is coming through. So Sunday afternoon, we're still clear in Toronto. The winds are pretty light and we're going to be above the freezing mark, so it's going to feel a lot warmer, but that cloud cover builds and into the evening hours. Here it comes another round of snow with this system. We'll see it move through throughout the evening and it's going to continue into the overnight Monday morning drive to work. Things should be clearing out for us. A little bit of mixing down towards the Niagara region, out towards Kingston as well, and then the winds easing too. So as we look at some of the temperatures here, as we take you into Sunday evening, we're at the freezing mark, and that snow is coming. More snow, yay. <laughs> Thanks, Rachel. <laughs> no problem. Hollywood is gearing up for the 93rd annual Academy Awards, but stars are already arriving in California. The Spirit Awards went ahead today, a ceremony celebrating independent filmmakers. Zuleka Nathu has more from Los Angeles. It's a day before the Oscars, and not only is this award show different in that it's on the beach and not in Hollywood, but there's some other differences as well, namely with the nominees. Let's take a look at the category of Best Director at the Oscars. As you can see, there are no women nominated in that category. And if you look at the Independent Spirit Awards, well, two of the five nominees are women, and that's for Hustlers and for Honey Boy. We caught up with the cinematographer, who's also a woman behind the film Honey Boy, and she said that she is a member of the Academy and things need to change. It's because the films that make it to the Oscars are all the high budget films, you know. And so in that level, you have less diversity altogether because the diversity has only started 10, 15 years ago. Like we, all my generation, we all really had to fight to get there. But one of the most significant differences between the two shows is right here in the category of Best Supporting Actress. Take a look at the nominees for the Oscars. As you can see, there is not one person of color in the nominations for that category. In fact, out of the four acting categories at the Oscars, so that's 20 nominees in total, only one is a person of color. And if you take a look at the same category for the Independent Spirit Awards, every single nominee for Best Supporting Actress is a woman of color. So that shows that a lot of the criticism coming from people saying maybe there weren't enough strong performances by women this year or not enough good films done by women doesn't hold a lot of water if you see that a lot of those same films are being recognized here and not at the Oscars. The Academy is changing. It has launched an initiative to bring in more diversity into its membership, but for now it still remains predominantly male and predominantly white. Zuley Kanathu, CBC News, Los Angeles.
A gunman in Thailand went on a shooting rampage today. At least 20 people are dead and 30 more wounded. The suspect is a soldier and people at his army base were among the victims. The gunman moved from the base to a crowded shopping mall. Hundreds managed to flee and more were rescued by security forces. There are reports the shooter was angry over a land dispute and that during the rampage he posted regular updates online. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is in Ethiopia today where he's trying to build support to get Canada a UN Security Council seat. He's leading a charm offensive with African leaders, but the Canadian bid has competition. Catherine Cullen reports. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was meeting with one African leader after another today, including the heads of Egypt, Rwanda and Ethiopia. He also made a little bit of history by being the first Canadian Prime Minister to address a session of the African Union. All of this, of course, aimed at one goal, Canada's quest to get a UN Security Council seat. He's trying to drum up support amongst the world leaders here. Canada has competition and one of those competitors is here too. The Prime Minister of Norway attending many of the same events, meeting with many of the same leaders as Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Now, Norway's Prime Minister spoke with Canadian reporters. She said she didn't want to amp up competition between the two countries, but she did tell Canadian reporters why she thinks African leaders might want to support Norway instead of Canada. Canada is a bigger economy, a larger country, of course. But on the other hand, of course, we have uh, we are using more on development aid. We have used more for support for the international policies. Uh, as part of our JDP. Now we asked the Canadian government spokesperson available to us today about Norway's comments. The Minister of International Trade didn't have a lot to say, only talking about strong connections broadly between Canada and Africa. We also asked her if she was confident that Canada was going to win this UN bid. We are pursuing this uh, uh, with energy and, uh, and because we believe that Canada really has a uh, a very positive role to play on the on the world stage. Now Ireland is also in the running for this seat and all the countries involved believe that winning it will give them more relevance, more influence internationally. But Norway's Prime Minister said today that it is also a burden of sorts. It forces countries to make some tough choices, but choices she says they should be making if they believe in international cooperation. The vote for that seat is scheduled for June. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Addis Ababa. Candidates for the federal conservative leadership are in Nova Scotia today. They're addressing provincial progressive conservatives trying to drum up support in the race to replace Andrew Scheer. Hannah Thibodeau has that story. So there were five leadership hopefuls who addressed the progressive conservative AGM in Halifax today. They had 15 minutes. For the two perceived front runners, who are Peter McKay and Aaron O'Toole, they largely focused on attacking Justin Trudeau and liberal policies. So for Peter McKay, at one point he was talking about the climate uh, and how Justin Trudeau has managed that. He says he hasn't managed it very well. His environmental policies, he says, aren't working. And he's also not getting Canada's natural resources out in an efficient way. Take a listen to what he had to say. Think of the jobs that could have been created in Atlantic Canada with Energy East to bring to our region a pipeline from Alberta and Saskatchewan with resources to be refined and exported from here. The export of highly regulated, ethically produced, competitively priced LNG brought to the world a world that needs energy. Even the United Nations has said we're going to be using fossil fuels for 40 years. We're not the problem. We could throw all our car keys in Halifax Harbour, turn down the heat, turn off the lights, walk around naked in the dark, eating organic beets, and it won't make a difference. So he didn't focus specifically on what his climate policy would, uh, would be. However, that is to come in some time between now and the end of the leadership race. However, he was focused on mostly going after Justin Trudeau and the Liberals, trying to show members that he could replace Justin Trudeau in the next election. Same for Aaron O'Toole, Ontario MP Aaron O'Toole. He focused a lot on Justin Trudeau as well and saying that he's not working hard enough when it comes to getting jobs for Canadians. Take a listen. 
more than anything else, we have to show that we will fight for jobs and opportunity for all Canadians. Unlike the Trudeau government, who constantly seem to be fighting for attention from global celebrities and media pundits. So what these two gentlemen are doing is what they're trying to show members is that they could potentially, if chosen as leader, have a good shot at going after Justin Trudeau and the Liberals in the next election campaign. So when it comes to policies, neither had many specifics. Their teams say the policies and the specifics for those will come at a later date. I'm planning out to become hopefully a Canadian hurdler. I'm actually a track athlete. This is kind of a stressful day. Dozens showed up to show off their speed, strength and endurance in hopes of one day representing the country. More on the event next. Rachel's back with a look at the forecast. Okay, snow possibly on the way. What about these cold temperatures? 
Well, we're going to get a little bit warmer tomorrow, going above that zero degree mark. So not as much sunshine, but a bit warmer. One for our forecast in Mississauga on Sunday. But yes, more snow. Snow is coming in. So let me break down this system for you. We see more cloud cover building as we go into the afternoon. Then into the evening hours, here comes the snow, remaining pretty steady as we go throughout the overnight. And then into early Monday morning, we actually could see a little bit of mixing. So rain mixing in with this along the shores of Erie. But for the commute, Monday morning, getting to school, getting to work, the roads should be clear. So we're hoping this timing really sticks because I know Monday morning in the snow, not going to be too fun. Sunday evening, we're at the zero degree mark in Toronto. That's when the snow is going to be widespread across the south. In terms of this extreme cold, we are getting a little bit warmer. For snow, about five centimeters with this system for Toronto. Kitchener could be seeing about five to ten, and then the Niagara region about two to five. Now, when it comes to the cold, we're getting a bit of a break into Monday and Tuesday, but we are not done with this deep freeze. Some of the colder air will be returning. So look at us. By the time we're into Thursday and Friday, that is a sharp drop in temperatures. Barry, minus 11. That's the daytime high for Friday. So it looks like we could see a little bit of snow as we end off the week, and then some of that colder air is coming through. So find the snow brush and find a really good parka because you're going to need them this week. Lots of winter to go. Have them and won't put them away. <laughs> Not yet. Thanks, Rachel. You got it. More than 200 aspiring Olympians put their skills to the test at the University of Toronto today. And then obviously it's the physical ability, but also uh, when we do interviews after, uh, the mental component is really important to us. The young hopefuls had the chance to show off their stuff as part of the fifth annual RBC training ground, which aims to discover promising athletes. Running for me, it, it's just a feeling of freedom. Just like when, you're, when you open up your stride and you're just in that last down stretch, you can't feel anything but what you're thinking. Ah, uh, man, he's an incredible kid. Like, um, I mean, when he reached round 12, he was smiling um, a lot for us. When I reach round 5, I'm angry. I want to get out the beat test for him. So for him, doing that is uh, pretty incredible. Several athletes discovered in previous years are now Tokyo 2020 medal hopefuls. Good luck to them. And that is our show for you tonight. We want to leave you with some visuals from the 15th annual Ice Fest in the Bloor Yorkville neighborhood. This year's theme, sculptures inspired by the 80s. Check it out. Have a great night, everyone.